This message is brought to you by danmullerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Muller messages and growing. Now, please enjoy this message. I'll tell you, that worship time was so amazing because there was that one song, we just worshiped him. I mean, great is our God, and it just ramps, right? But did you notice most of these songs are like, you guys are singing what he accomplished, who we've become. It's like the songs are a message. It's like they're preaching through their song. And you can just sit under their worship and go home and have a revelation if you give your heart to what you're singing. Like, I wouldn't have to get up here and preach this stuff. You guys are tearing it up. Like, that, that, them last two songs were like, that's the whole finished work right there. Like, that's the fruit of what he accomplished. If I believe, yeah, let's just go. This is amazing. That's how I felt. I was like tearing it up. You guys are amazing. So Joey just said about not seeing them that way. The little word that God gave him is huge. 2 Corinthians 5. It's so scriptural. It's amazing. I guess God would answer you scripturally, wouldn't he? 2 Corinthians 5, 13. Paul said it's the love of Christ. I'm just, I'm just springing off his word for a second. There's some things we need to accomplish this morning. But I want you to see what, how powerful that word was that he just shared. It's, 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 it's a big deal for all of us. Your perspective is huge. If God can change your view, he can change your whole life. If he changes your eye, he's changing your life. Your perspective determines who you're going to be and who you're, right? Look, you can't become what you can't see. You can't become what you don't yield to, but what you yield to, you'll become. When you see him as he is, you'll be like him. You guys with me? Your perspective's huge, so your war is not flesh and blood anyway, so enemies aren't flesh and blood. It just, enemies in the, in the flesh sense seem to be people that are contrary to what you're pursuing, working against what you believe, all that stuff, and we tend to see them as enemies. But you have to understand, they don't know who they are and what they're doing. Forgive them, Father, they don't know what they do. 2 Corinthians 5, 13, it says, the love of Christ compels us, or compels me, Paul said, for I judge something. He doesn't judge people, he judges something. He judged, I judged something that if one died, he's meaning Jesus, if one died, all died. All right? That's amazing. So he paid a price to redeem all men, and he sees men through a truth in such a way that it compelled him to die to, in order to bring them to life. Okay? We were yet sinners, and he sent his son. So why would he do that? Why would he have the ability while we were yet sinners, we hadn't even changed? to go ahead and die because he sees us for more than what we understood. He sees us for what he created us to be, our purpose, our potential, our destiny. So the cross is all about redeeming your value. It's all about who you're created to be. It's perspective. It's the eye of the Lord towards humanity. Like on your darkest day, he didn't go, I just can't believe they're doing that. Ah. He said, wow, you're so much more than that. And where sin abounded, grace abounds more. And he wants to draw you and woo you out of that lie into him. So we're not making sin permissible. We're not saying, hey, it's okay, whatever you do. No, it's actually, it's, it's something God wants to change, but he does it through his goodness by teaching you a higher truth about you. You follow me? The love of Christ compels me. It's 2 Corinthians 5. You can turn there if you want. I, I mean... I just, I get the word in my heart, man. Sometimes people say, you know, you don't read out of your Bible. Well, if you listen, the Bible's inside of me. It just is. I, I filled my heart with the word. So that, and listen, you ought to fill your heart with the word so you can get to know God and know who he is and understand truth because the word's truth. I mean, Holy Spirit's a spirit of truth. The word is spirit and life. Sounds connected. Jesus is the word. Yeah. So his life speaks loud to me. He's the word made flesh. Jesus is the word that came and dwelt among us. So God didn't come and preach a sermon to me. He put it in flesh and bone and he lived out the sermon. So the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld him in grace and truth. So you look at Jesus' life and you see the truth. You see the word and you follow him. You don't just sing to him. You don't pray to him when you're overwhelmed. You follow him. Yeah? I love that about God. He didn't just preach at us, guys. He sent the word to live and demonstrate and dwell, and we have a pattern to follow. So, yeah, man, that's exciting to me. So watch this. So he says in 14, he says in 13, he says, if we're besides ourselves, it's for God, and if we're of sound mind, it's for your sake. So uh, people have fun with that scripture. I tell people, if I'm all alone with the Lord, you're not around, I'd probably look like I'm not. 
of sound mind sometimes. I, the Lord has overwhelmed me. I'm not, I'm not a flake. I don't believe it's a flake. I don't believe, I, I just know that sometimes you cry hard, so hard you couldn't express yourself if you had to. Sometimes you sit there and your heart's just seeing and your emotions are overwhelmed and you can't hardly function. I've sat on my bed and I've had God feel like he's raining on me and the love of God is so overwhelming me because I'm seeking him, I'm finding him. But, but it's an overwhelming experience. Don't seek that experience. Believe his love. So I, I don't talk about these manifestations a lot because then everybody wants a manifestation. Oh, will you pray for me and impart that into me? And I'm like, no, no. Your greatest blessing is believing him. The strength of your heart is the stronghold of faith, believing God. Why is faith so important? It separates you from sensuality. It separates you from how you're tempted to feel. Guys, we lived our whole life out of our feelings and our feelings haven't done us a good job. Come on, we spend countless hours ministering to one another based on feelings, impressions, memories, flashbacks. Has nothing to do with truth. You see, yeah, but I have feelings, yeah, and God really wants to redeem them. <laughs> and align them to truth. He really wants to move them out of the way because they're not, they're not, the, the, they're not feelings that are in agreement with truth. They're usually contradictory. People say, well, God gave me intellect. He gave me the ability to reason. No, no, stop. Seminaries walk on thin ice on this one. They say, don't let anybody infringe on your God-given right to reason. Your reasoning ability you grew up with isn't God-given. It's perverted. God did not give you the ability to talk yourself out of Him. Hello? We became that way. Here's what we've done. We've studied a fallen man and say this is us. We're supposed to see Jesus and follow him. Like, like people, intellect and IQ, I see that as a gift personally. These are just personal beliefs. It's not always fair to, safe to share that, I mean, but it's, I am just being honest. Personal, personal belief. IQ, a high IQ, I think that's a gift. I don't think that's a curse. I don't think that to be intellectual and, 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 and have a high IQ is a problem. I believe analytical is not a gift. People say, well, I'm just analytical. And I'm like, that is not something to boast in. That's something to crucify. But you can talk, talk through on something so long that you make something simple, complicated. God says, don't eat the tree. The day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. It's pretty simple. Oh, you're not going to die. God just knows that the day you eat the tree, your eyes will be enlightened. You'll know the knowledge of good, you'll know, you'll be just like God. She already was like God. There's so many traps there. Reasoning in such a way to get you to make something simple, complicated, and question what you know. Paul said, I'm concerned for you, Corinthians. I'm concerned for you, O Corinthians, that like Eve was deceived by the serpent, you also have been removed from the simplicity that's in Christ Jesus. That's analytical thinking. That's your mind working against truth. Just rationalizing and reasoning to such a degree that you take something simple and matter of fact through the word, complex it and get a muddy view. You have every reason to be encouraged and you think about it so long in a way that all of a sudden you're not sure you're encouraged. That's not a gift. <laughs> Yeah, leave that one wrapped and under the tree. <laughs> it's, it's not a gift. I want you to see what Paul is talking about here. This is, this is what Joey shared with you. Watch. For the love of Christ compels me. He really says us. The love of Christ compels us. He's bringing everybody into it, but I promise you he's writing from a personal level and perspective. The love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, not someone, we're judging something, that if one died for all, then all die. You know, 1 John 2 says that, beloved, or little children, I write these things to you so you do not sin. He's talking about John 1, which gets horribly misconstrued, and maybe we'll touch that, we'll see, but. Not maybe this morning, but we'll see. He says, I write these things to you so you do not sin. And he doesn't say when you do. He says, but if you do. I love that. He's not binding me to sin. 
He's telling me something new has come and the influence of Holy Spirit. And if I fix my mind on righteousness, it's fruit, the fruit of righteousness. What's righteousness? Remember to talk about things giving birth last night? What's righteousness give birth to? Righteousness produces and gives birth to holiness. When I see myself righteous, my life starts being conducted in a righteous manner. So righteousness has two meanings in the Bible. Usually in the New Testament, the two strong uses of righteousness are the ability to stand right before God and he sees you right in his sight through the finished work of Jesus and through the blood and any expression or manifestation of the fruit of God, of who God is, of his person and his attributes. So any work of righteousness is a manifestation of love, mercy, peace, tenderness, loving kindness, surrender. That's a work of righteousness. So watch this. If I see myself righteous, then the fruit on my tree is going to be holiness because it's going to look like him. If I believe I'm one with him, I'll conduct my life in a confidence one with him. It's not presumption. If I believe I'm clean, I'll live clean. To the pure, all things are pure. Yeah? It's just powerful, guys. Righteousness is amazing. So watch this. And there's, 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 there's some things we might need to teach on that more. You guys... As a core here, I'm very impressed in touch with you guys. I'm humbled to be here. I, I'm seeing leadership. People are so solid. I just met you, PJ, but he just shared some things, looked me in the eyes, and I'm like, man, everybody's so solid in leadership. I'm looking at all you young folks, and you guys are just gleaning and growing and yay, and you're seeing these songs and going, yeah. And I'm just like, something good's going on, man. It's just fun to fly here just to sit in on your worship service. Seriously. Like, like, I'm not here because you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just a confirming voice. And out of the mouths of two or more, every word's confirmed and established. We're just nailing things down, getting it locked in. And if you would be tempted to be discouraged because of natural events, hopefully getting that lie a million miles away from you. Don't get trapped in idolatry, the subtleties of idolatry, and let something matter more than what matters most. The light in you matters most. Don't get sentimental. Don't get caught up in relationships to such a degree that something takes you away from someone. Come on. Look, I hope things work out for you. I, I, I hope the things we're believing for all manifest. But in the event that things don't go the way you were hoping, you better have a stronger foundation in Christ in you than the thing you were hoping. You say, well, hope deferred, brother, makes a heart sick. There's nowhere it says your hope has to be deferred. So don't let it. It's when you let your hope die, your heart sick. He's the God of all hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope, anchor of your soul. Everybody quotes that, well, brother, you know how it is. Hope deferred makes a heart sick. Well, why is your hope deferred? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, I didn't get my prayer answer. Don't let your hope rest on your prayer answer. Let your hope rest on Christ in you because your higher priority is to shine, not get your needs met. Come on. Yeah? Come on, guys. That's just good, solid preaching right there. I, I can feel that in my heart, man. Come on. I've seen too many discouraged Christians. It's unscriptural. It just proves, it's an indictment against us that we don't have a revelation of why he came and why he's in us. Please, I said this last night, I say it all the time, and don't get tired of hearing it. Don't turn the gospel into a survival kit. Something that gets me through, make it to the end, or something that's here just to bless me and meet my needs and fulfill my desires. The gospel transforms you, makes you more like him, so your light shines in the earth. It's that song we sang, man. I'm not loving myself, man. I'm, you're living in me, and I'm going to love everyone else. I'm thinking about everyone else. Wonder if you really, wonder if you really, wonder if you really wake up in the morning and say, nobody owes me a thing. And I'm not alive for me alone. I'm alive for his name and others. Wonder if you actually start believing that. I wonder if you sow that into your heart in prayer. I wonder if you wake up and communicate that with God. You won't carry care. You won't get trapped in anxiety. People won't get on your nerves because you'll get new nerves in the process. People won't get under your skin because you'll get new skin in the process. 
not chapey, flaky, chap stuff that cracks and breaks and oozes and hurts. Talk about your soul, not your physical skin. <laughs> You'll get new skin. Yay, smooth, baby. <laughs> Am I messing up or are we okay? You guys are, I'm just being relatable. I'm just trying to relate some things. Actually, I'm trying to read this because Joey got it stirred in me and I'm preaching a lot of other stuff as well. So it'll all work out in the end. I love this section of scripture. I love this section of scripture. Remember where we started this and why we read it because Joey heard the way you love your enemies is not seeing them as that. Because if you see them as your enemy, you'll treat them as such. What you see, you'll... Yeah? So if you see them as more than what they understand, instead of being frustrated by them, intimidated by them, or threatened by them, you actually have compassion for them and mercy. So even if the only access you have to them is praying, at least you'll pray from the right heart in the right place. How many times do we pray because we're frustrated, antagonized, had enough? Think of how prou proud and audacious it is and we don't even realize it, how self-righteous. You're actually thinking of somebody that bothers you, you take it to prayer and pray to God as if you have this special in with God and He agrees with your view of them. But God, you just need to change their attitude. And the whole time you're praying, you are ripped with attitude. It's like so hilariously, sadly hilarious. Like, well, God, you need to just knock them off their high horse. I don't know who they think they are, and you need to straighten them out. God, I pray that your mighty spirit come and blow like a rushing wind and knock them, God. Okay. <laughs> so what happens? You so stereotype them through your belief and how you see them that when you get around them, all you're doing is watching to see if your prayer took. And you're actually very problem conscious and you've stereotyped them. You're very aware of what's wrong with them and you've lost sight of their potential. And they're, all they are is a bother to you. Well, I promise you this, they're not a bother to God. And where sin is abounding, grace is abounding more. Not to empower sin to transform lives. Yeah? Come on, guys, that's just solid. That's how God is. If he wasn't like that, none of us would be sitting here with his spirit inside of us. And that impresses me. It impresses me that God lives in me. And I've done nothing right. I just believe the truth. But he made me for something that he's paying for, to redeem. And I want to live that. Paul lays it straight, man. He says, I haven't apprehended, but there's one thing I do. We ought to listen to this. Paul said, there's one thing. He didn't give us a multiple choice. There's three different things I do. He said, there's one thing I do to apprehend. To apprehend what? To lay a hold of that which he laid a hold of me for. Do you see you're not a Christian for you? You're a Christian for his great name, and there's a reason he apprehended you. There's a great reason he obtained you through the purchase of his blood. He has intention in your salvation and through your salvation. And Paul said, look, I don't want to just be a Christian. I don't want to just be saved. I don't just want my name in the book of life. I want to do one important thing so that I apprehend the very reason he apprehended me. I want to fulfill purpose. I want to walk out his why in my life. Do you get that? And guess what the one thing was? I forget what lies behind. And I move forward to what lies ahead. See, that's how you never let hope defer. If you get your eyes back here, you're missing today and the future. And all of a sudden, tomorrow's yesterday. Tomorrow's yesterday. Tomorrow's yesterday. What a non-productive life. You forget what lies behind. You I say it this way, and I'm not trying to be funny. It just struck me one day. Wow, no wonder we don't look back. We're not Lot's wife. We're his. So we look up from whence comes our help. We're not in that covenant. We're in a new covenant. And we look to him. Amen. So if old things are passed away and all things are new, there's nothing back there. You be real careful with that one. Don't you get trapped letting yesterday identify today. Don't say, well, it's hard for me to receive the love of God because I didn't have a real loving dad. 
Look, I'm sorry you didn't. I didn't either. Not being insensitive. I can relate. Has nothing to do with God loving me. God loves me through his son, not my dysfunctional childhood. Why do we make it make sense? Because we call them both father? It doesn't even make sense to me, but it's all over the church. Well, I can't receive the love of God because I didn't have a loving father. You don't need to jump through hoops. You need to have faith. You can't fix that. You believe through that and say, wow, well, I'm letting my dad be the reflection of God. What a deception. Jesus is a reflection of God. My dad could have been, wasn't. I'm done being deceived. Look, if your dad lived that way, he's a dry cup, agreed? And if you're trying to drink out of a dry cup, of course you're thirsty. Why don't you drink from a well that never runs dry and just one drink, one drink, oh, one drink, just one drink, never thirst again. He's talking about total fulfillment, established identity in the midst of a dysfunctional memory of a dysfunctional childhood. Just one drink. He's saying, this truth is greater what you've been through. What I've been through restores you from what you've been through. Keep your eyes on me. Don't let this be an idolatry. And don't make me have to try to come through this. You bring this to me and I change everything. It's the truth, man. I'm just telling you, I'm aggressive with it because I see a lot of us buying time that we don't have to buy. And we're saying, yeah, but you don't know what it was like when I was growing up. You're 45. And then we psychologically say, yeah, but these things have a long-term effect and there are hooks that get us. And no, watch this. In the end, in the end, in the, I'm not being insensitive. In the end, there's two C's of people. People that believed the gospel and people that believed their lives. You say, yeah, but I was touched strong when I was a kid. You don't understand. wonder if I was. Let's stop playing that card. Not everybody has to relate to everybody's horror story. Listen, there's people in this room, you have been through hell. But you don't have to look far to see somebody's been through a little more. So it's not fair to say you don't know what I've been through because we've all been through. So what are we going to do? Take a survey, see who's been through the most hell, and then call these guys up and sing all about heaven? And then continue to make it all about hell? I'm sorry if they touched you wrong. wonder if I was touched wrong at around age four. How's that changed the gospel now that it's come? It just means people are perverted. People have issues. People don't value life. People are trying to meet their own needs through others. It just points of sin and dysfunction. Don't you let sin and dysfunction get so rationalized in your mind that you allow it to cause sin and dysfunction. Don't you let what men don't see determine what you do see. He's the light of the world. Don't say, well, I'm this way because. No, if your because isn't Lord, you're looking at the wrong truth. Are you guys okay? Good. Man, come on. I'm not being insensitive. I'm trying to tell you I understand we all have our stories. But I think it's his story that transforms our lives. I don't think it's what we've been through. I think our focus is wrong. I think we're very self-centered in this and won't admit it. And we always say, well, you don't know what I've been through. Well, what about what he's been through? Is anybody going to focus on that if that's the life-changing event of the universe? Is it really about what you went through? Are we tricked into trying to find sympathy and sentiment and somehow make up for something that was so bad as if we feel like somebody or someone even owes us something? Well, that someone paid his life to get you out of darkness into light and transform you through the renewing of your mind. So don't let matter more what matters most. You can no longer say you don't know what I've been through because that means your eyes are not what he's been through. Look, my dad was alcoholic. He's never, I never heard my dad saying, I just love you. He made an attempt to take us places and do things with us, but he was usually intoxicated. We were always intimidated, and you didn't want to say wrong things. And, and he, you would pay for that. He wasn't abusive and mean, but he was unpredictable, drinking and 
There was no real connection there. My mom was sick for 40 years. In my opinion, she died young. Don't tell me I don't understand. Don't compare your story to mine because that's not even fair for us to do to each other. Because it was my own personal go through and yours and we're different and we handle things, but it's the same truth that sets us all free. Yeah. You know, I grew up in the city. I guess you'd call it a city. I grew up in the city. I went to city schools. It's different. City life's different than country life. You say, well, drugs are everywhere. Yeah, I know, but you got kids all around you. You got hands-on pecking order, esteem, reputation. You're fighting to stay in a certain place. It's just, there's, there was, for me, when I look back on it, it was challenging growing up in the city. I mean, everybody had a big brother, whether you did or not, because it saved you a few times. Man, you better not mess with me, man. I'll get my brother. Like, you ain't got no brother. Oh, yeah, I do, man. He's 18, dude. You don't want to mess with him. He will bust you up. <laughs> Somehow you escape just by pulling that stuff. <laughs> now I can say I got a big brother. You don't want to mess with him. <laughs> he is really bad, man. <laughs> He's got my back, my sides, my front. <laughs> it just fascinates me he lives in me. You know why he does? Because he wants to. <laughs> you might not want to, but he does. He wants to live in me. He wants to live in you. And he paid a price for that truth. Why? Because he wants to reveal himself through you. He doesn't want to live in you so you feel better. He lives in you so you shine. He lives in you so he fulfills the reason he made man. His image covered the earth with his glory. This young lady got up and talked about revival, and she's right. A revival is here, and it's in the hearts of men. And it's going to be the most healthy outpouring and revival that we've ever seen. Because it's going to continue through truth and through relationship and communion. And it's masses of people revived that are relived. They're revived. They, the thing that was dead is alive. They revive. Right? And, and, and that thing is alive and they're living a certain way and nothing can quench it once you see. You get it? It's just, a, it's a neat, I think this, this is what we call revival. It's not an outpouring of manifestations. It's not so intense that we can't leave the building and we want to stay here the rest of our lives. It's, we're being empowered and imparted to in such a way that there's a great marriage between coming and going and we're coming to enjoy Him, be sharpened in Him and by Him, encouraged by one another, rub elbows, lock arms, and we head out looking more like Him than when we came. That's the revival we're in. And it's you living your life in Christ within the sphere of influence you've been granted. And if you multiply the number of faces that I'm looking at by the sphere of influences we've been granted, you're covering a whole area. It's called revival. It's you walking in love, walking in the Spirit, and walking in Him. It's not you just getting a better job and praying yourself through a promotion. Go ahead and do all that. That stuff's not selfish. What's selfish is when you let the outcome of that dis dis decide your disposition. That's where selfishness comes in. It's not wrong to pray for those things. It's not selfish to believe for a promotion or a new job or, God, I'm really asking for a good buy on a car. That's not selfish. But if those things aren't happening and you aren't getting that new job, make sure you're shining in the one you're in and make sure you're faithful in the little things so you can make you ruler over more things. You've got to take the talents you have and make sure they multiply. And then he'll give you more talents. And if there's somebody not using theirs or bearing theirs, they might roll over on you too because you're a faithful steward. Next thing you know, you find yourself loaded with talents. Not full vats and barns, loaded with stewardship. God entrusting you with kingdom grace and things so you can multiply a truth that's living in your life. Okay. It is good, man. Thanks. I'm feeling that. I'm feeling like, man, you're preaching solid. It's your fault, Joey. You started me on this, and I can't even read the whole thing, but I got to because it's really here. There's just so much in the gospel. And it's funny because I go, I'm reading it. 20 minutes later, I'm thinking, hey, we got to read this sentence again. It's not distraction, or you'd get distracted. It's not a rabbit trail. Rabbit trails are distracting. This is just God's spirit. Just covering ground, man. 
The love of Christ is about the fourth time I'm reading it. The love of Christ compels us because we judge this, that if one died, all died. And he died for who? For all. Watch this. That's all. You can't say this gospel doesn't work for me. Well, that's for you. Well, you're just different. No, they're cop-outs. They're justifications for the flesh. They're deceptions. They're human expressions of weakness that are justified by natural wisdom. A line of facts that you assess and come to an assessment that's not producing life. That's called deception. Come on, did you get that? You get tricked into an assessment, a pattern of assessment, a line of thinking that when you're done, your outcome isn't producing life. That's called deception. Man, you could put that in Webster's. It would be awesome. It's deception. Believing something you're not. Believing something that's not truth because your line of thinking empowers it. Look, he died once for who? For all. I was in a church last week and I got really strong for a while on suicide, and it really hit me hard. And I got really talking about it, and I said, you'd be amazed. There was about 500 people or so there, and I said, you'd be amazed how many people are sitting here, and those thoughts come to you in a very rational way, out of the blue. And I was saying, I know it to be true. People were coming up weeping. I had no less than five people immediately tell me that was them on a regular basis. And then the next day, several more told me the same thing. See, what happens is these things come and they're, 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 they're strategies, they're demonic strategies, and they try to infringe on the value and destiny and purpose of your life. And they try to take natural facts and wrong belief and lack of understanding and attach itself in a way that you assess it and the thing sounds rational. To where all of a sudden suicide actually sounds feasible, it sounds like an option. Let me tell you why it's the most deceived thing a man can do on the planet, I believe. It's because it brings your life to an end. Why is it the top of the list, in my opinion? You get deceived into believing it's all right to take something that's not even yours. You say, well, it's my life. It never was, friend. It's, a, it's an absolute expression of total deception in the fall of man. It's man thinking for himself. It's not your life. Abortion, same. Well, it's my life. I'll do with it. Well, hey, if it's my choice. It never was your life. It's his life in you. Look, what he paid for isn't your life. He paid for his life in you. He paid, sin evicted him from his home. He took care of the problem so he could move back in. Yeah? You take the lie out and move back in. Home again. Ah, oh, home sweet home. <laughs> Yay. So suicide is the biggest lie because men get deceived, women get deceived, youngsters get deceived into taking something that's not even theirs. I've learned this, that a teenager will commit suicide, 14, 15 years old, and their closest peer of circle of friends start getting the same exact impressions within days. The same exact temptations, feelings. It's amazing. It's demonic strategies. Satan's like a roaming lion, a roaring lion. I mean, roaming around, seeking who he may devour. He's subtle, snake in the grass. I'm not trying to get you freaked out by Satan. He's a cut off withering branch coming to nothing, but you don't give him place and you're not unaware of his devices. He's looking for weakness. He's looking for vulnerability. He loves when you say, I just can't take it anymore. He says, well, there's a landing strip for more. A mom says something about, I just love my children so much, I would just die if anything would ever happen to them. My life would be over. That's idolatry. That's not a mother's love. It's idolatry. Because you're saying your kids matter more than your eternal purpose. It's okay to talk about these things. If you're getting mad at me, you better look at idolatry. I'm just telling you, I'm not being mean. I understand love and I understand try. I understand that if something like that happens, we've got to walk through and hold on to heavy grace. But you don't set yourself up for trouble and give yourself away. And he's roaming like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for vulnerability. 
He's looking for a limp in the herd. He's looking for weakness in the flock. He's looking for an easy target that he can sneak in and take down. Wrong believing, wrong thinking. Self-centeredness is his number one search. If you read the book of Job, you find what the devil believes about all of us. He doesn't believe any of us in this room actually love God. He believes we need God. And we're good with God as long as he's meeting the needs. But if the needs aren't met, he says to God, Job's no different than any other man. You've hedged him in. You've blessed him. You've made him fat in the land. You take away what you've blessed him with, and he will curse you to your face like any other man. The devil's saying, I ain't impressed with Job's character. Are you kidding me? It's because you've blessed him. You've hedged him in. You've ministered to him on every side of his life. This guy's the fattest man in the land, circumstantially. No wonder he praises you and blesses you. Because you've been nothing but good, circumstantially, to this man. This man ain't no different than anybody else. I've been watching man from the beginning. Remember Eve? Ha, ha. Remember Adam? Puh. That's how arrogant he is. And he's not impressed with our church stuff. He's impressed when you love not your own life unto death. There's people that make this technical and just serve doctrine. They confess, it's the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And you love not your own life unto death. You confess the blood all you want and the word of the testimony all you want, but if you love your own life, those two aren't moving in power. The power hinges to love and not your own life. It's not a safety net. It's the finished work of Christ. Yeah. He's roaming around seeking whom he may devour. I'm not trying to get you devil conscious. I've I preached it for years. There's two things I never think about. I don't think about sin or the devil. I don't at all. I really don't. Now I'm preaching. Things are coming to mind. Why? Because there's little vices, little tricks, little snares. People out of the mouth getting snared. All of a sudden they eat the fruit of their lips. God's will in life and you're speaking death. God's saying I love you and you're putting yourself down. Be careful you don't put yourself down to get attention from men. That's a, that's, a, that's a human device. You put yourself down so people praise you. That's a twisted accolade. Don't you serve in a church so people praise you. That's how you get your feelings hurt when they don't praise you. You can't get offended if your motive's love. You're not serving in the church to get accolade. You're serving in the church for the sake of the kingdom and others, and you're glad to serve. Nobody owes you a thing. So you can't get offended in service. But if you're serving to be recognized and noticed, you're risking offense. And then people don't praise you like you feel you earned, and now they call Sister Sally up and say, hasn't she been amazing? Man, for the last three months, she this and this, and we just want to honor her. We're thinking her this morning. And you're sitting over there and saying, three months for the last year, I did it. Ain't never called me up there for nothing. <laughs> Dead giveaway. You aren't walking in love. You're gleaning from accolade through service, and it's a sickness. It's not healthy. It's an emotional twist. You find an identity through false praise. It's, it's, it's bad. It's no different than drug abuse and addiction. So then you go the extra, extra mile. Now you get the double servant of the year award. And now you never leave the church, and everybody praises you, and you're just so committed, and you feed off of that. Instead of wearing the identity of son, you wear the identity of I spend all my time in the church and people praise me for it. And that's where you find your identity and that's what makes you tick, so that's what you give your life to. It's different than love and true servanthood. You guys okay with that? Come on, it'll protect us. I hear leadership. I've been in the meetings and I, I don't do good in those meetings. I kind of... I, I kind of interrupt meetings sometimes. I'm like, whoa, guys, I hear what you're trying to say. It sounds so psychological. Like you're saying, make sure you make sure all your leaders are encouraged. They're encouraged in the Lord. You don't, you don't just write them notes and say thanks for serving so they don't get bummed out. If they have the potential of being bummed out, we ought to seal that up and heal that so that you're not the one that's making sure you keep them encouraged. Like people say, make sure you encourage your helpers. 
Well, it should come natural and it shouldn't be needed. And only then is it healthy. Are you guys, is this, is this okay? Listen, if I need you to thank me and I need you and I'm living off your thank you, then it's not even cool when you thank me. It's not your fault. You're just being sincere maybe. I need an adjustment. I'm living off the thank you. When I don't need to thank you and I don't even feel like I've sacrificed because I'm loving you and loving the king and we're living for the kingdom, your thank you can be healthy because I don't need it. It's like, wow, awesome, wow, okay. And it's humbling. Are you guys with me? But if I need to thank you and I'm not okay if I don't get it, I need to relook at what motivates my life. That's why there's a lot of hurt in the church. We're doing things for ourselves in the name of the Lord. And there's a lot of letdown and failed expectation because there's a lot of unspoken expectation. The gospel calls Joey to live trustworthy, but it tells me to never put my trust in him. But he's supposed to live trustworthy. But it tells me not to put my trust in men. So that if Joey lives outside of what I seem trustworthy and I don't fall apart and get freaked out and let what happened stereotype him in my mind and reflect on all men. And all of a sudden the leader failed and now all, fa all leaders are failures. And all of a sudden you build false walls and defense mechanisms to protect your own hurting heart when you can live unoffended. People say, well, I just keep my distance because I'm tired of getting hurt. I'm like, whoa, you probably ought to look at that. We say, well, God heals the brokenhearted. Our hearts get broke through life, brother. No, no, God heals the brokenhearted. <laughs> so you can be a minister your whole life. I could do this. I'm telling you, I could do this and we could have results. Watch. But it's not results. It's emotion. I could say, I'm telling you guys, God loves you so much. I realize some of you are in... in in, in proper situations, you are under pressure. Some of your spouses aren't on the same page as you. Some of your bosses don't understand your faith. And you guys are constantly under pressure. And I know after a while, it tends to take a toll. And sometimes your heart wants to be strong, but it feels weak and overtaken by the life you have to face. And right now, God wants to restore your broken heart. If you're feeling weary, if you're feeling hurt and taken back, I want you to come up here and God is going to come and he's going to heal your broken hearts. And I'm telling you, people will come crying and powering up at this altar. And it's not the gospel. We should be teaching people why they don't have to be broken. Instead of just saying it's normal and having a life set in ministry. You're always needed then. You can always have an altar call, baby. People are coming because everybody understands. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. That's exactly what my week was like. And all of a sudden, you're more shook than you were before they talked. You actually felt okay when you came in. <laughs> now your palms are sweating. I think he's talking to me. I better go for prayer and impartation. <laughs> we better be very careful when you hold the authority of this and you're stewarding the pulpit. We're not looking for a manifestation. We're not saying just because 150 people came in and knelt and cried that that was a move of God. You better be careful they're not crying because their week was that way and now they're really thinking about how challenging their week was and they're just crying because they're overwhelmed. And you see, yeah, but that's why we're having the article so God's peace comes and touches them in that place. Yeah, but if you don't change their truth and reality, they're overwhelmed again next week. So now we have an altar call and after a year we say we have had 52 moves of God. <laughs> Probably not. I might get in trouble for this one. <laughs> Take it off the leadership. They don't know what I'm about to say, but I'm trusting it's all right because it's here. No, it makes sense to us. We do this stuff. We have great intentions. I'm not, I'm not putting down our intentions. Our intentions are great, but we get off base of the gospel, and we don't realize we're catering to emotions constantly. And we think it's ministry. So we say, some of you have never had the love of a father. Some of you have never had the blessing of a father. Some of you have never had your daddy just hold you and say, I love you. And you just can't get past that. Guys, you're promoting idolatry. What you're saying is the finished work isn't enough. That there's something you need in the natural 
to make you okay apart from the blood. It's an emotional message. So you line up a bunch of men and you say, just come to one of these. They're going to stand instead of your father and hug you and God's going to restore that missing father link and all that stuff we say. So the people come up and they're bawling like crazy and crying. I've checked out. You might be amazed that I'm bold about this because I'm not presumptuous because I interview people and I talk to people and find out what was really going on. I was in a service a while back and I went over, somebody was ministering. I'm like, I went over and I said, can you tell me why you're crying so hard? And he said, because I feel so condemned and I feel like there's no way back to God. And the altar call was the total opposite. And he's up there kneeling, crying uncontrollably. And everybody thinks, wow, he's getting wrecked. We better be careful with this stuff. You don't get a bunch of men to take the place of their dad. Because what you're saying is they can't be okay unless that gap's filled. And that we need a natural man to hug and represent a dad so that unless I have the love of a father, I can't be free in the love of a father. It's absolute idolatry. And most of the people are crying up here because they're actually face-to-face -face and aware of the daddy deficit in their life. So once again, it's their focus, it's in their face, and they feel insecure or unloved. You say, so what's your answer? Go in a bedroom and close the door. You don't need a, a man to take the place of your daddy because nobody can. You just, it's called faith, guys. It's called believing God. Remember? Two seas of people. One sea believed the gospel. The other believed life. You get in your bedroom. Father, I just thank you for the revelation of your love through your son. Man, for years I just clinged on the thought that my dad wasn't there and he didn't love me and didn't want me and he even suggested adoption and I found that out when I was a teenager if it's even really true, but I sure let it hurt me and affect me. I internalized it and let it reflect on my value, but man, have you blown that out of the water. Man, have mercy for my dad for where he is or isn't or whatever he's seen or not seen, but I know this. You have valued me and you have loved me and you have sent your son to deliver me and rescue me and you have put identity in me and confidence in me and you have absolutely made me rock solid apart from my childhood, Uncle Johnny's wrong touch when I was three and all those things that tried to swallow me up. You have snatched me out of darkness and translated me into the kingdom of the son of your love. You don't need deliverance. That's deliverance. He has delivered you from the power of darkness. Translated you in the kingdom of some of his love. It's time to believe that. Christians, by the score, seek ministry for a manifestation of God's love. They're going into says, why can't I receive the love of God? You can believe it. Wow, you really love me or you never sent your son. That works for me. Yeah, but I have never felt the love of God. Stop chasing feelings. Manifestations are a dime a dozen. You're chasing feelings, you're out of bounds. Now you're getting a manifestation, it's not even God. You might be amazed. Because you're not even pursuing what God told you to. Faith, the just shall live by faith. Yeah, but I just want that touch. No, you want that knowing. That knowing will introduce a touch at some level because the knowing is what you need. Because if you need the touch, you'll need another touch. And another touch. And now you're addicted to the touch. And now you're an order called junkie. <laughs> and the only time you get close to God is in a corporate setting because when you're at home, you don't believe the best about you and you're condemned and you're veiled. But because you experience something at the order, that's your lifeline. And now you run back for another one and another one and another one. And you lay on the floor and you shake and you cry and you get up and live in pain and hurt and offense and insecurity. That is not the gospel. You guys good? Okay. I know I'm touching some stuff that's sensitive to people. It's just here. It's, it's just here. We, God, he paid us to be healthy. I want you healthy. I'm not saying this because you're not healthy. I'm saying stay healthy. In fact... I've perceived nothing unhealthy around here. Like I've been here, I'm impressed with the foundation here. I'm impressed with the idea and understanding of what he accomplished and who you have all become. And there is a corporate sense of joy here that's undeniable and something feels really solid. So why wouldn't I talk like this to guard what he's building and keep it established and never let a little fox into the orchard? Yeah? just protecting 
No, it's good. I just, I just went where my heart went there. But Okay, actually, you probably don't believe me by now, but I'm going back to 2 Corinthians 5. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is powerful. He died for who? So I just preached for 20 more minutes on suicide and the value. He died for all. Here's, here's something I don't know if we totally... See, I can't even get past that stuff. It's so much here. Watch. He died for who? Okay, watch this. How many of us, be honest, in your life has struggled with your value, your identity, your esteem, and you felt pressured by people in life, felt insecure like you had something to prove and be in the eyes of men to be acceptable? That's a majority of people. But he died for all. Watch. You go into Walmart. You got price code, bar checks, price codes. You got scanners. Why? Because you got shelves. It's a super Walmart, super center, man. It's like, it's like your sin as far as east and the west. It's like product. And there's so many different prices in there because there's so many different products and there's so many different values to so many different items. But in the store of humanity, you got one price tag hanging on every head. Why? This is not an overstatement. Oh, I want to jump down here. This is not an overstatement. This is not Christian hype. There is no one in the earth to God worth less or worth more. No one. Or the price would be different on heads. <laughs> Same price for every man. Same value. No one is low. No one is high. Let every mountain be brought and every valley. And the biggest lie is insecurity and esteem in people. Starts at a very young age. And you assess all the facts. Well, my parents didn't really seem to love me. My mom wanted to get rid of me. All she did was use drugs. She just wanted to use drugs. She didn't have time for me. She just loved drugs more than she loved me. And then that hurt. And then that makes sense. And then you find two more friends that understand your pain. And by the time you're 12, you are way out there. And it's not even you. It's a deceived little girl that's believing lies that God knows has a great potential and he already paid the price for her redemption. Now she's sleeping with guys and she's 12. Now she's pregnant at 15. Now she's doing drugs at 18. Now her kids are taken by the social services and we look and say, what a detriment to society. Boy, she's just living in the gutter. She's just such a low life. There's no such thing as a low life. There's people deceived and not living up to their destiny. It's deception. Jesus nailed it for me. I'm following him. I'm not following psychology. I'm following him. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. So in all you're getting, get understanding. So if we can get our eyes on truth, walk in truth, and get truth to men, things can change. If you judge books according to the cover, you're going to make mistakes. You're not even going to turn the page and read the book. Watch this. Watch this. He died for who? Oh. Yeah. That those who live should live no longer for who? No. Themselves. This stuff is actually scriptural. <laughs> but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, we now, oh, from now on, from now on, we regard no one. Regard who? No one. According to what? Wow. Why? We judge something. If one died, we all died. And if we live because he died, and we no longer live for ourselves, but him that died, and therefore we never see man again for what they're doing, producing, failing to produce. We see him for what they're called to, their destiny, purpose, and potential, just like he saw me. I don't ever again read a book by the cover. I don't see men for their flesh. I see men for their destiny. 
So you know how you love your enemies, Joey? God said it. I bet he has white hair. Read your Bible. I bet God has white hair. He said, you know... He says, you know how you love your enemies, Joey? Don't see them as such. Boom! What a profound revelation. Simple and profound. It can only be God. Simple, but so profound. Just don't see him as such. There's a song worship leaders sing, Dancing on the Streets of Injustice. You know how you dance on the streets of injustice? By not letting injustice produce injustice in you. Not repaying evil for evil, but overcoming evil with good. Toning down a harsh word with a kind word. Letting mercy triumph over judgment. Letting love cover a multitude of sin. Hi, Miss Cindy. I just saw your face. Bless you, honey. Good to see you. Sorry. <laughs> saw her face. I said hi. Hi, everybody. I just saw your faces. No. <laughs> I just looked and saw her. <laughs> you guys doing good? Man, this was good to me. Therefore, you judge no man according to the... That would be like, hey, you know Billy? Oh, yeah, I know Billy. Yeah, he's the one that... He just always needs attention. I can't stand there to get around him. I just got to get into another room. Be careful with that stuff. Just be careful with that stuff. You don't judge any man according to the flesh. Jesus said, don't you judge with outward appearance. You judge with righteous judgment. Look, anybody can look at somebody. It doesn't have to look long to see what might need to change in their life. It doesn't take a man of God to find what's wrong with people. It takes a man of God to look past that and find that there's potential and there's gold deep inside the ground. And honestly, if you look at mining and the, and the behind-the-scenes mining and all Ain't nobody ever mined for treasure and dug deep for gold or dug deep for diamonds or panned for gold and didn't get dirty in the process. You just don't let that defile you and you get on, you snatch your brother out of that thing. You got to see men for a deeper truth than what they're portraying. And you got to know that every man is worth the blood. There's people that are lost and they have no understanding. You say, well, they're willful. I get what you're trying to say, but they need seeds sown into them so something new can grow. They need some ground plowed up. They need some water poured. Yeah? Sometimes they just need to consider something. Look, you could go up to a man on the street and, and you could say, hey man, you look like you're in a lot of pain. Yeah, I'm in a lot of blank and pain. What is it to you? Well, you're nosy? I don't know. No, man, I care. Oh, you care. Yeah, you don't care. Oh, I do care, man. I was hoping I could pray for you. Pray for me. Get away from me, you religious kook. I don't want nothing to do with God. I don't even believe in God. You probably just want my money and want me to come to your church. Just get the blank away. Who knows somebody could talk to you like that? It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It's just reflection of where their heart is. So don't you get taken back and don't you say, man, I ain't stepping out anymore if that's what people... <laughs> don't make this about you. Be more secure than that. Come on, you got to re-question why you stepped out in the first place. Did you do it for you or did you do it for them? Well, I just got hurt. That's a good giveaway that you did it for you. You were trying to qualify or something. Make yourself feel better about what you say you are. Don't get caught in that. Come on. You're not losing anything except your heart goes out to him more. And you just look at him and smile and don't get offended and take it back and you don't go back and debrief your approach and try to revise it so you get this Holy Spirit spooky method of just wrecking everybody. That's what we think. <laughs> they despised Jesus, guys. They put him on a cross. They called him cuckoo. He didn't have to debrief his approach. He's the Son of God made flesh and he was the Word living. They hated him. There's times they're going to be deceived enough to believe they hate you. Don't make that your truth and reality. Learn to distinguish what's happening. And don't antagonize them and then quote scripture. Well, they hated Jesus, so they hate me. <laughs> There's people out there trying to antagonize people. They're holding up signs. God hates you, sinner. They throw an egg at them. They say, yeah, gospel. I'm telling you, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
Jesus, help. <laughs> I'm in deep waters. <laughs> That's what I'm feeling. Listen, the second person a week later walks up to that same man who looks grumpy and unapproachable. I wonder if we start living this way. The first person, if he's not careful, he thinks he did something wrong. He thinks he needs to brush up or pray more or revise his approach. Or second person comes along, hey, sir. I'm telling you, if we all start living this way, it might be later that day. It might not be a week or a month, thank you. Second person walks up, one of you, same man in your town. Hey man, you okay? What in the blank is it to you? What are you, why are you asking me? Well man, it looked like you were really hurting. I was just hoping I could pray for you. What in the? <laughs> You're the second person in how, ask me, man, get away from me. What is this town coming to? You need, I don't believe, okay? I don't believe in God. Listen. Read, but I don't believe in your fantasy God, man. Get out of my face. Leave me alone. Listen, man. Cool. I just care. There's a such thing as just sincerity, and I honestly feel like, I, yeah, just get away, man. Bless you, bud. Okay. And you just leave. Don't try to get the last jab in there. Just express yourself a little bit. You can, you can perceive grace. I go far with people sometimes, and sometimes I don't go far at all. Sometimes I really go far. I'll be like, are you kidding me? Do you honestly feel that way? Like you don't even know me. You've been so touched by life, you're going to stereotype me and throw me in the box? Come on, man. wonder if my motive's pure. There's a such thing as purity. wonder if I really care about you. wonder if I'm not a kook and I believe God can change your body or I wouldn't be foolish enough to ask to pray. Because if I thought he wouldn't do nothing, I'd be a fool to ask. So maybe I believe he could and would. What do you say, man? You got nothing to lose. We're this far. Why don't you let me just pray? <laughs> I'll go that far with people. And a lot of times they'll go, oh, what the heck, man? Go ahead, man. <laughs> what do I need to do? Right. Just stand there. <laughs> you just slip in there real gentle. Fire of God! <laughs> no, <laughs> See, you like that. You guys like that. You guys like that. Why is that so funny to us? We like that. We, like, we want people to burn, don't we? I told a story one time how I was coming off a plane. I came off a plane. I had four people ask me to pray for them in the jetway before I could get out of the jetway. It was kind of like coming to a service and people come up to say, hey, and talk. I felt like I was in a service and everybody knew me. Like, I was coming off the plane because I ministered to a lady and was talking and God showed up. I couldn't get out of the plane. I got down. Excuse me, trembling. Yes, ma'am. I couldn't help but to overhear. And I, that was the Lord. Yeah, it really was. Well, what, what's up? Do you have something to say? You want to, what do you, I, I was hoping you could pray for me. I'm like, oh, okay. And I tell people, you know, I just, oh, that's so precious. Sure, honey. I just, fire! <laughs> <laughs> You know, we like it. It's not fun. I had a lady in a, in a, in a, in a, in a food market, in a, in a market. Like, you should have that farmer market out there. We have one indoors. 12, about 12,000 people go through there in a weekend. So I just went in there and set up a booth. The Lord had me go in there for two years every Saturday morning because it's not my life. He told me to do it. I said, sure. I just set up a booth and put a sign. I wasn't allowed to solicit. I couldn't pursue. I couldn't shout out a word of knowledge. They told me, you can be here, but you can't solicit the people. They have to come to you. I said, okay. You know what was cool? Seek and you'll find. Draw near, he'll draw near. If they came through the door, they were done. <laughs> like, it was a swing door, like in a saloon on a cowboy movie. They had a swing doors, and if you came through the swing doors, you were done. The door cracked you from behind. You were in there. You were done. I'm serious. So I prayed for this lady with addiction, and she went out in the, on the floor of the market, and she's just on the ground. And you think that's awesome. That is not fun. I'm like, God, no. Like, why? Because everybody has cell phones. They think she's having a seizure. They think it's a medical emergency. They're all calling 911. There's 30 people calling 911. And your biggest challenge is getting them to put away their phones and trust that she's okay. The husband's bawling and she's laying on the floor. And they're going, oh! 
please, she's okay. I mean, there's an instant crowd. I'm not, ha I'm not being silly. It was trouble. I'm like, God, why do you do that? Like, <laughs> don't do that, please. I'm asking humbly. I, I don't know how to handle that. So I'm at this place, I don't even want you. I don't need you to manifest. I need the cancer to leave. I need the pain to go. I don't need you to shake and quake. I've seen people shake and quake and the cancer's still there. I don't like that. It does something to me that just bothers me. I, I want the cancer to go. My goal is the cancer to go, not for you to shake. I've seen people in the church, they say, oh, I'm just going to pray for you. The anointing is so strong. In Jesus' name. And they're going. <laughs> and they say, amen. And the people are like, are they okay? Wonder if the person's okay that's shaking. Do they need prayer? Are they having a seizure? Come on, if that's God and he's so on you, you're going to rock the world. You're not going to confuse him when you touch him. If this is a distraction to the person you're praying for, you probably ought to get a grip and say, whoa, I don't think it's about all that. And they're looking like, you, you lay your hand on them and they're just standing there. Okay, honey, well, thanks. Thanks, sir. Shabba, have a good day. Have a good day. And then you got your three friends, they're all Shabba, and you're pss, pss, ah. And they're walking away, still sick, going, whatever. We probably ought to relook at that one. <laughs> Did I just do that with a camera? That could be scary. I'm not trying to hurt nobody. I'm saying there's some things we've got to relook at. You know them by their fruit, man. Come on. I've been in supernatural schools where the kids feel con compelled to manifest or they're not spiritual. And I perceive it and talk about it and the leaders cry and say, thanks for being aggressive. We didn't know how to touch it because we don't want to interfere with somebody's real encounter. Come on, you know if it's real. You live with you. Don't you play stuff and dull your heart and senses and teach yourself that this is what it is because it's so much more. Come on, I've seen, I've seen terminal cancer leave people's bodies and they didn't feel a thing. There was a time in my life I got so tangible when I prayed for the sick and you couldn't even see my hands shaking, but they felt like they were huge. My hands felt heavy, my arms would tingle, it would vibrate, my face would get numb, my ribs, and it almost hurt sometimes. It was so intense, I would feel, and I got like a man, I was like, yeah. Let me <laughs> and one day the Lord said, Dan, you're really leaning on those feelings. That's just a grace to let you know I'm on you because I'm asking you to do things you've never done. He said, it's like a child learning to walk and a parent just patting their bottom, encouraging their steps. Stop living for the manifestation of anointing. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Because <laughs> it's fun. It's intense. And I was finding that the more I felt him, the bolder I was. The less I felt him, I'd try to stir it up. So I was starting to make the tangibility my faith instead of the finished work. And one day I was driving in my car and I realized that I had prayed for a bunch of sick people two times in a row and they were perceiving things and they got touched by God and people got healed like I was seeing, but I didn't feel a thing. And I'm driving in my car and I said, Lord, why did I not even feel you when I pray? I don't feel you at all when I pray. It got, I'm not being silly. When I would go to pray for the sick, it would almost feel like I wasn't born again, like he was gone. And he did it on purpose to break me of that leaning on that thing. And, and I said, Lord, like, I don't even feel like you're in the room when I go to pray for the sick right now. What's going on? He said, Dan, you've been caught living by feelings, so I, I love you. I'm removing them. Watch. He said, so you minister unlimited. I've called you to believe, not feel me. That's what he told me. He said, removing the feelings was opening a door so I could minister unlimited. And just believe he is. For any man that comes to God must first believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those who, and it's impossible to please God without. Those manifestations are a simple grace to 
encourage you to step into things that he's asking you to do that you've never done. Just false, it's the grace. Preachers will preach, wait on the anointing. You're anointed. We're making it tangibility, so if people don't feel something, they don't feel qualified, so they don't pray for the sick because they're waiting for the buzz. So because they're not feeling it, they act like they do sometimes, so they fit in and insecurity overwhelms them and they're living in an internal torment because they're trying to be one of the group because their hearts are sincere. And the teaching is actually taking them there because it's condemning them. I'm just telling you, I've pastored and I've been around all the stuff I'm talking about and I've seen it and it's not good. So young people gather together and all of a sudden identify with manifestations so they all feel compelled. No, 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 you be with him. And you believe. And you say, but I've never felt the love of God. You believe the love of God and you get to know the love of God through his word and through Christ crucified. I can't tell you how many hours I've sat on my bed in my life and just thought about him coming as a man and how he responded to people and how he never let them change him and how he's still changing men. And it just impresses me. I just can't thinking like that. And while I'm thinking like that, I'll just lift my hands up and I'll just say, thank you. Yes, Lord. And he's just burning truth in my heart. And I'm just sitting there just dwelling on the person of Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Don't feel a thing. My heart sees. My heart knows. Don't have to feel a thing. So when you don't have to feel a thing, guess what sometimes happens? You feel a thing. <laughs> Why? When I preach on righteousness, it happens to me all the time. I don't talk about it much, but I've talked about it. Because people see they go after those manifestations. They're longing for that as a missing link. Like, oh, if that would just happen to me once, that would settle it for me. No, it wouldn't. It would make you want it again. If it's that important. When I preach on righteousness and right standing with God, and God seeing us as his sons and sin free and spotless, I feel the expression and experience of human hands wrap around me and hug me from behind. And it feels like a head laying in the middle of my back. Now, I didn't say that to wig you out or freak you out or make you think that's some demonic thing. To me, it's always the person of the Holy Spirit saying, I love you so much, that's exactly how I see you. And he encourages me that when, when I'm preaching, it says, and you think, settle down. Why are you so passionate? Why are you, get you don't understand. I actually believe the living God is hugging me from behind, cuddling me while I'm preaching it, going, atta boy. You try to stay calm. And then tell me how I should preach. I had a guy say once, you need to learn how to stand on an eight and a half by 11. I said, man, I'm not in seminary. Come on, stop that. <laughs> Jesus is wrapping around me and you want me to stand on an eight and a half by 11. Not today, friend. <laughs> Tomorrow's probably not gonna work either. <laughs> and then there's times he'll come upon me and I've done a 45 minute hour thing and they're just, <clears throat> right? It's just the Lord. So the how-to and the five steps and the way to effectively. There's a guy came to me, he said, you probably don't even know that companies send their people that speak to groups of people to classes to teach them how to speak and hold attention and do, and there's, there's like, you, you, there's, a, there's a course on public speaking. And I said, well, now that you say it, I mean, I, I, it doesn't surprise me, of course, I guess there would be, but I've never thought about it. He said, see, I didn't think so. He said, it's amazing. He said, you're standing up there doing everything they teach. You could be an instructor if you knew what you were doing. <laughs> but you don't know what you're doing, so you can't instruct. <laughs> but they said, you're doing everything that they teach you to do. But I don't have a clue. It's all innocent. Yeah? So I guess I'm for real, man. I'm for real. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Okay. Let's do this quick. I try to do this a lot lately. I don't know why I've been doing it and not going there and preaching it. I turn there and then I go everywhere else. Kind of like I just did. But let's do this quick. Because what time do we have to? 1230. 12.30, really? And what time are we coming back? Two? Why oh, don't I just aim at about 12? That'll give, guys, that'll give people time, plenty of time. Okay? Yeah. Because, man, I feel like he turned back the sun on me here. I feel like I've preached a lot in a long time. What time did I start? This is rare I feel this way. I'm like, not that I've run out of things. No, don't think I'm saying that. I'm like, oh, I should have brought more notes. Should have brought my other notepad. Uh, 
And I'm not against notes. My pastor uses notes and he's a good preacher. It's just God told me to minister the way I minister. It's a grace on my life. You know what he told me years ago? He said, I'm going to put revelations of my love and righteousness in you and you're going to speak to many people. And I'm just listening like, he said, however, I don't ever want you to preach your Bi read your Bible to preach a sermon. Don't ever pre read it to preach a sermon. Only read your Bible to know me and only ever speak out of who I am in your life. And that'll multiply. So that's what I do. That's why I get up here and go, because I'm just preaching to us. Like I'm not preaching a sermon. Like I didn't study all night thinking, how am I going to cover two sessions a leadership luncheon and a question and answer. Oh, Lord. I'm just ready. It's a message. It's what you've become. And honestly, you can only impart what you've become. It only, it reproduces after its own kind. So if all you're doing is preaching doctrine, you might be just stimulating knowledge and throwing doctrine on. If you're just Bible teaching, be careful with that. Just Bible teaching. Because all of a sudden we think to know is to grow and because we can quote the scripture, we've become the scripture. I know people that quote all kinds of scriptures and they're hurt and they're mad and they're angry and they're discouraged. Your goal is not to quote the Bible, your goal is to become it. Okay, I'm not against Bible reading programs and reading in a year, but don't do it apart from relationship. Don't read your Bible. Don't even listen to YouTube or you guys say, you've been so gracious, I listen to you all the time. No, that's great. But make sure you have more vital time with Him through what you're hearing me say. So when something I'm saying grabs your heart, shut it off, man. Just shut, throw me in a corner, right? Like people say, man, you put me to sleep at night. I'm thinking, that doesn't sound complimentary. <laughs> Let's turn on Dan so I can sleep. I'm like, what? Don't let me put you to sleep. Let's stop that. You say, oh man, I got you on all the time. You're in my car constantly. Well, that's great. I understand what you're trying to say. But make sure you're being with him because the whole goal of what I'm preaching is to establish relationships. So what, here's what I'm saying. So you're hearing a revelation that I'm speaking and God's speaking through me or a scripture I share and it's touching your heart, right? So, so you turn off. Just shut me off, man. Boop. Just mute me. It's the only way you'll get me quiet. Mute button. <laughs> No, actually, I'm a very good listener. I can listen. I, I've learned that if you listen, you can hear what's going on and you hear the heart of a person if you listen. I'm a very good listener, but I have a lot to say. But shut me off and say, wow, Lord, you be driving in your car. Keep your eyes open. <laughs> Maintain a healthy speed limit. Don't say I was so drunk in the Lord, I was going 105 in the other lane. <laughs> Don't blame that on Jesus. Stop that. That doesn't impress society. <laughs> Better believe I was DUI, man. I just came from church. Okay. <laughs> Your license, please. <laughs> it's amazing the stuff I've seen people do. I get so drunk in the spirit, I've got three tickets in the last month. I'm like, stop. <laughs> stop. Just stop. Now we have designated church drivers. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help us. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm doing. Stop the YouTube. Wow, Father, it's amazing you see me that way. Man, you know, when I heard Dan say that, it just touched my heart. I know that's you. You really do love me that way. Your love is that real. Man, that changes me. Thanks that I can put my total trust in you. Man, you know how my trust, I felt it broke and hurt and bothered by all those things I prayed and cried over. Man, I had my eyes in the wrong place the whole time. I have never felt more secure, felt more secure and realized a more healthy identity than I have in you. You're realigning my emotions, my feelings. I just feel like this is the most, keep your eyes open. That's right, we're driving. You. I have never felt so solid in my whole life, God. Thank you for what you're doing to me. And you commune with him and you flip it back on. Ah, I preach it. Wow, that's amazing. God, that's so true. Man, I used to fight that no more. That's exactly how it is. Commune. Talk to God. Develop relationship through the truth. 
and let the truth make you free. Why? Because you continue in it. You're not just listening to it. You're engaging with him, and he is the truth. You know? I say to people, what would, what would, what would we look like if we'd stop asking for prayer for so many things that are actually truth issues? Listen, don't hear me wrong. Prayer is so important in so many ways, and there's faucets of prayer, manner of prayer, and prayer is important, and pray with all manner of prayer, pray without ceasing, pray fervent in prayer. I get prayer. Prayer for the nation, prayer for leaders, protection over families. I get all that. But we're ministry-minded. And somehow we got the idea that ministry makes me free when it's truth that makes me free. And we've been reduced to thinking we need prayer for every bump, bruise, feeling, and emotion that doesn't feel good. And we say, pray for me. I'm just, I don't know what's wrong. I'm just going through a lot of, I don't know. I just feel insecure. I need you to pray for me. Then all you're saying is, I'm seeking to feel different than insecure. But there's a reason you're enabled to feel insecure and it's attached to your belief system. You can wake up in the morning and just relate to two weeks ago and go, oh man, this is exactly how it was when I woke up last week or two weeks ago and that day was bad, man. This just feels like it's going to be one of those days. I know what I'll do, man. I'm going to call Joey. He rocks. Joey will pray me through. Dude, when that guy prays, I just feel better, man. Brrr, Joey. Hey, man, what's up? Listen, man, it just feels like it's going to be one of them days. I don't know what's going on, but I just need grace. Would you just pray for me? If Joey's not sharp, say, oh, sure, man. Father, I just thank you. Shh, God. Joey, you're the best, man. Thanks for being there always, dude. Then you're going to go to work with the capacity to wake up again one of those days. Next thing you know, you need prayed through. What about your communion and relationship? If Joey's not careful, he'll start finding his identity in the fact that you need him and he rocks. What about waking up in the morning? Man. Lord, I'll tell you, I'm not going to try to make nothing up right now, but I feel like I could stay in bed another hour and a half. I don't even want to get up and go to work, but the truth is your grace is greater in me. The truth is you give me a sphere of influence. You give me a job. And the truth is you're just greater than what's going on in my feelings right now. And God, I just thank you for the honor of life, and I just thank you. Next thing you know, you're stirred. Next thing you know, truth. Next thing you know, you're spirit man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next thing you know, you're like... I'm amazing in God. I'm really ready to roll. God can change your perspective? Come on. That's like waking up in the morning. Nine minutes later, me, me, me. Lord, I don't feel like getting up. I don't want to get up. But you know I got to go to work. I need your grace, God. And you're sitting up there. If I don't get your grace, I don't know what I'm going to do, God. <sighs> Lord, and I don't know, but if you don't change that ball soon, I mean, how long am I supposed to put up with him? Because I, he just don't get it. And like, I'm trying to be a good employee. And, you know, he just, he just hard on me all the time. I'm just asking you, would you just give him, would you just get him off my back? Like, and if you, if you don't change him, just let him pull my application over there. And because I'd love to go to that company. I, I would. And oh, I wanted to talk to you about the car. I don't know. When that car gets into the intersection, it feels like it's stuttering, and I don't know. I just need you to touch the car. But, man, okay. Well, I just need your grace, God, if I'm going to get through today, because I don't even feel like going to work. But please give me grace. I'm trusting you. That's not prayer. That's delusion. It's self-focused, self-centered misunderstanding spiritualized because you're using scripture or saying his name or something. <laughs> Are we okay? 
You crawl in bed at night. Here's one we do. The day is so challenging. Who's ever had a really challenging day? And then you get home, and if you're not careful, you don't thank him at the end of the day for faithfulness and a sure established relationship and keep a right perspective. So all of a sudden, you crawl into bed, and your bed's your savior. You made it through the day. And it's like the only time you said God today was when you jumped in bed. Oh, God. And you're just making love to your pillow. Oh, God. And then in the morning, you don't want to get up, and we call it depression sometimes. I understand depression is a lot of other things, so don't get mad if I'm not being mean. No, you can't face what you barely survived, and you never wrapped faith around your life. So now you can't get out of bed and go back into what almost destroyed you. It's not depression. You guys with me? So you don't crawl into your bed as if it's your savior and you survived and you made it through the day. There's just a truth to this stuff, guys. That's why I'm turning you to Colossians 3 and I'm going to close with this. And I'm going to teach you something here, hopefully. I think this will teach you. I got my Bible so colored it lays here. I can't, I got it the glare, so I got to tilt it like this. And the glare gets off and I can, that's why I was having trouble reading early. I was standing there and I'm like, man, I got my Bible. See, my Bible's off. It's pretty. All them colors mean something to me. They're all conditions for promises and commandments. When you see orange, that's a promise. When you see purple, that's something I walk in that releases that. This is cool. There's conditions to promises. His love's not conditional, but there's conditions to promises. Watch. Children, there's a child here listening. First commandment with a promise. Honor your mother and father, and it will be well with you, and life will be long. It'll be well with you and life will belong. What's the condition to that first promise? Honor mother and father. It'll be well with you. Life will belong. So if you don't honor mother and father, what? Might not be well with you. Life might not belong. Is that the sovereign will and choice of God? Or is that reaping and sowing? Wow. I don't know why God let that happen. I don't know why. And it's hard for us to talk about this kind of stuff. Are you amazing or what? That's about the most thoughtful thing. That's ridiculous. That's good stuff, dude. That's really good. I don't even know why I'm preaching. You guys are like amazing. No, I know why I'm preaching. But you are amazing. That was just as thoughtful as they come right there. Let's go to Colossians 3 because I was touched by that, PJ. Thank you. Have I met you long enough to call you PJ or, okay. or JP or PJ? <laughs> See, I haven't known him long. I want to make sure I have the initials in the right order. I just didn't know if that was too intimate, too quick. PJ. Colossians 3, are you there? You guys have a Bible? If you have a Bible, jump there. If you don't, just listen. It'll make sense. The little word if in the beginning of the chapter is a little Greek word It actually means since. Paul's not questioning your salvation, throwing you into work, saying if you're really raised with Christ, then you need to do this. What he's saying is since you're raised with Christ. Since you're raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Do you know how we use the Lord's Prayer for healing and it stirs faith? And I'm not saying it's wrong. It's actually a neat tool to stir faith. We say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we say, no cancer in heaven, so no cancer on earth. It gives us a precedent to pray against cancer because there's no cancer in heaven, no cancer on earth. It's scriptural, and we pray. But here's what we tend to do. We always make the Lord's Prayer, what we call it, the Lord's Prayer, we always make that about the power of God. And we always use it to spring off of sickness and verify the will of God concerning sickness. But wonder if it has as much to do or more to do with the heart of God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no animosity in heaven. There's no rightness, comparison, pride. There's no self-centeredness. There's no power play, manipulation, spouses given silent treatments. Guys, 
It is possible today in our today's church to sing the most amazing songs, wave a banner, and actually feel close to God in that moment, and go home, get offended by your spouse, and give them a two-hour silent treatment and manipulate and control them with your body language, and make it all about you and your displeasure. And all you're doing is revealing you really don't know Jesus like we just sang. Because he doesn't do that. It's a learned behavior by living apart from him. It's a self-centered mechanism. A silent treatment, I think communication is a lot better. Communication without passion and hurt and offense. Because as soon as you communicate with passion, you shut down people. What I mean is offense passion. I'm not talking about passion. I'm talking about hurt, offense, frustration, displeasure, well, you really hurt me. Well, how come every time you always have to, and there's tone in your voice. Come on, it's not cool. Don't even allow yourself to live that way and say that it's acceptable. You be the steward of your own life. Don't make somebody else have to tell you. You say, you know what? Why would I do that? Your will be done on earth. As it what? Now that you're raised with Christ, seek the things which are not the... Why isn't that motives, perspectives, and reasons for being? Why isn't that the why behind your life? It can be, can it? Are you guys good? You got real quiet on me. You guys okay? Okay. Set your mind. Verse 2. See, it's the example I just gave you. Why is he telling you to set your mind? Because in a flash, you could revert back to an old way of thought, and you can let something rub you wrong, touch you wrong. Now, here's the thing you got to make sure you do. If that happens, don't believe you're failing and judge yourself as a failure. Don't get condemned. Realize it, and as soon as you realize it, go, wow. Man, God, I was just going into former ways. I, I just so thank you for the truth that's working effectively in my life. Man, there was a time my spouse would have said that, and I would have never recovered. It would have been maybe two days. I don't know. But man, I started to slip into that old expression and I realized, man, I am not threatened by that. That's just an expression of where they are right now and how they're thinking. And I don't need to let that change who you are in me. God, you're really doing a work in my life. Thank you for fathering me. That would make it amazing. Because then you're never going to fuel a fire. You're always going to overcome evil with good. I've done countless counseling with spouses and realized they're fueling each other's fires. They're just retaliating each other's fires. It's just, he said, she said, tit for tat. And they're actually fueling fires, thinking, thinking their language is putting it out. Well, honey, you know Jesus would never do that, and, you don't, and I don't know why. And, you know, and next thing you know, you think you're preaching at them, and they're like, they're not in a position for that. They actually need to grow in some things, so you're just actually fueling a fire. It'd be like telling somebody that you don't agree with their lifestyle that God hates them. And then they get mad at you and you say, see, they hated him, they're hating me. And you're actually antagonizing their emotion. Ah. Set your mind, what? On things above, not the things of the earth. Why? Why? See, you did not pray a prayer to go to heaven. I'm telling you, the Bible teaches you did not pray a prayer to go to heaven. Heaven came into you. You died to who you were so who he is could reign. You gave your life, he gave you life. We preach it, if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer. We make it all about going to heaven. He wants heaven into you. You could pray the prayer to go to heaven, come out of the, woman, out of the bar with a woman on your arm that's not your wife and say, hey, I'm cool, I prayed the prayer. You can pray the prayer and get your name in the book and go to work and still be angry with your boss and not even realize that you're called to love. Our goal is not getting people to pray the prayer to qualify for heaven. Our goal is to get them transformed by heaven coming into them through them dying so they can live. Because if you don't die, you'll never live. Unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. Do you hear the lonely place of selfishness? Alone. Yeah? Yeah? Look at your life as a canvas. Just a big canvas. It's a white canvas. It's a blank canvas, meaning a blank canvas. You can make it any color you want, but it's blank canvas. You can just draw these mountain horizons of mountains on that canvas, and you can put one little tree on, on the side of a mountain. That's you. 
The canvas is your sphere of influence and the, and the term of your life. It's called a gift. God gave you a blank canvas called your life. He makes you a tree in the picture. Say it's an oak tree. What's an oak tree produce? What do you say in California? Acorns or acorns? Oh, you say it right. Good. <laughs> There's people down south. I've been working on them. There's just... <laughs> acorns. <laughs> they say pecans. They got me saying pecans because that feels right because I grew up saying pecans. And when I said pecans, it looked like they were going to cast the devil out of me. They were like... <laughs> What kind of pie? Pecan pie. Pecan. <laughs> yeah, pecan. You know, pecans, you grow them everywhere. They're pecans. I'm like, oh. They're like, come out. <laughs> it's just funny. You just don't have to travel far, and we say things different, really different. Yeah. So uh, you got this tree. It's you. You got this blank canvas. It's your life. In this the Father is well pleased that you bear much and that your fruit remain. Isn't that amazing? So wonder if you were an acorn and you never thought about producing fruit and you never thought about what that meant and what you were really here for. So the oak tree is here to make more oak trees after its own kind and reproduce its life. But unless you die and fall to the ground, you abide alone. So your whole life goes by and you don't put anything into the ground. No sowing, no watering, no increase. So at the end of your life, your blank canvas is still a canvas and there's still an oak tree and it's still you and you lived your life. But you didn't reproduce according to what you were called to. You start bearing fruit on that tree and the acorns start falling to the ground. And every fall, the ground is just covered with acorns and all of a sudden you're bearing fruit in your season. All of a sudden the blue jay swings by, whoa, acorns, they finally produce some food. <laughs> they drop one, bury them in the ground, somehow chipmunks, squirrels show up, whatever. Next thing you know, what fell off of your life is planted everywhere. And now you've got trees coming up everywhere after its own kind. The next fall, all those trees have the same kind of fruit on them, or the seed. Next thing you know, by the end of your life, you can't even see the canvas. It's just one forest of oak trees. Why? Because one tree bore seed that fell to the ground. Are you following me? It's just ridiculously awesome. You take one grain of corn and put it in the ground. And if it's field corn, food corn for cattle and stuff, two ears. That might be sweet corn. Who's a farmer? Who's a farmer? No, I think it's field corn. Two ears, sweet corn, one ear. You take one full ear of corn and start plucking that thing and, and, and peel it off with your thumb. When I was a kid, I thought that was fun. And you put that all in a bowl. That came from one seed. That one bowl. You take that bowl and start putting them in the ground in one year and look what you got from one seed. That's kingdom. You got to think like that. That's your life. That's the potential of your life. How do you measure the multiplication of God when you plant a seed in faith in the hand of God? How do you even determine what that can multiply into? It's, it's immeasurable. So let's live this way. Okay, this is not my whole point on this, but I'm gonna stop early for you guys. I'm gonna stop at 12, that's my goal. So hang in there if you can. We'll stop at 12, you have almost two hours to go hang out, fellowship, lunch, whatever. Set your mind. The reason he says set your mind, he wants you to stay focused, keep your eyes fixed on why you're here, why he's in you, understand why you're a Christian, right? Understand your goal and your purpose in life, the potential, what he laid a hold of you for. It's to set your mind on things above, kingdom-minded, not getting distracted. He writes to Timothy, very militant, endure hardship as a good soldier, and now you've been enlisted, don't entangle yourself in the affairs of this life. Don't get caught up in the soap opera of life. You're in the kingdom, and the kingdom's in you. Now watch this. For you what? You died. See? It's amazing. You did not pray a prayer to go to heaven. You died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
And when Christ, who is your life or our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. This is pretty powerful. This is more than a Christian confession. See, there's a peril to not getting this. And all of a sudden, we let church attendance, ministry, faucets of ministry decide Christianity. And all of a sudden, what makes us Christian is that we're upper room or we're whatever. And all of a sudden, what makes us Christian is that we go to church or do church, right? And all of a sudden, you can let what you do in his name take the place of knowing him and becoming like him. It just happens, guys. You can take your children to church without even realizing this. This is not condemnation. This is just a catch net safety. Don't you get condemned by this. Be inspired by this. You can get tricked into taking your kids to church because my kids are growing up in church. So you take your kids to church but fail to produce, pursue Christ-likeness in your life. And without realizing it, inadvertently, you're teaching your children that Christianity's church attendance instead of Christ-likeness. And that has an ill effect on children. Because by a young age, I don't want to go, it's boring. And they're not understanding it's a life we live, not a service we attend. Oh, I'm going to, I got to do this. And if it's a service we attend and not a life we live, then it can create resentment because it's not even real. It's a good way to promote religion without even knowing it. You're just taking your kids to church and not pursuing Christ-likeness. You say, well, Dan, I feel pressured by that, man. I'm not perfect. Well, I'm not even talking about perfect. I'm talking about purity. There's a time you cross the line. There's a time weakness, and you're convicted, and you realize there's a time you might snap on your child while you're growing in this thing, and you go and sit him down and, ask, and get a hold in your heart and say, listen, and you weep, and you teach him humility and repentance and show him what it looks like to take accountability and be responsible for your actions. And teach good qualities so that they see it in you and admire you and aren't aware of your weakness. They're aware of how you care and you're sincere and you're pursuing truth and change. And all of a sudden there's something about your life that you think is weak that's actually inspiring them into something good. Yeah? yeah? Rather than, well, you don't have to understand. I'm your parent. You just need to understand. You just need to do it. My dad used to say, don't do as I do. Do as I say. I'm your dad. That's a great way to train up a child. <laughs> well, don't do what I do. Do what I say. I'm your dad. Listen. Yeah, but dad, you don't even get your eyes off of what I do. I'm talking to you, boy. You respect me. Don't do as I do. Do as I say. <laughs> Probably not the best parenting tool. Okay, so we're going to die. We're going to live our life in Christ. When he appears, we're going to appear with him. Wow, because our life's in him. Sound good? Verse 5, therefore, because this is true, in light of this truth, put to death. Notice here he didn't say balance, get control of. He's saying kill life as you know it in the flesh. Kill it. Put it to death. The first thing on the list, I won't go too deep with this. I'll just get you thinking a little bit probably. The first thing on the list every time. Ephesians, Thessalonians, Corinthians. The first thing on the list is sexuality all the time. It's the number one thing on the list every time that he tells you to put off a list that sexuality is the first one on the list. Why? Because it's been so misconstrued, so exploited, it's so sensually driven that it's gripped us in one way or the other, almost all of us, in some fashion. Almost all of us, not everybody. But it's been a stronghold, sexuality. Very aware of it, needs, drives, desires, fornication, just the need to be with somebody, express any sexual function and activity outside of covenant union and marriage is fornication. It's not, well, but we didn't go all the way. Yes, you did. You fueled a furnace that's on holy fire. You're, you, it says, like, look, watch this. Okay, watch this. 1 Corinthians 7 says, it's not good for a man to touch a woman. I didn't just violate and sin it's against the scriptures. It means with desire. It means with passion, with intention. You tell me, oh God, are we, are you serious? 
You tell me how two people that aren't married. Yeah. I was thinking maybe I'll just roll over and get knocked out and we'll just stop. Some of this stuff tries me. It's like, are you serious? I really believe this is God. So my life's not my own. Let's just go there. Oh, don't write me, okay? Just pray about all this. You tell me, you be legit. And you tell me how two people that aren't married and have no covenant and haven't surrendered and given their life can lay and kiss on the lips and rub each other's backs and hold each other tight and not have desire. That's why you're kissing. Well, there ain't nothing wrong with kissing. Stop arguing with me and justifying your flesh and keeping that furnace raging. And just listen long enough to understand. Come on. You tell me how you can lay behind a girl that you really, really believe you like and you say you love and you're spooning on the couch watching a movie and her hair is all up in your face and nose. You on it, man. You're like, oh. And you even talking Jesus. And she leans up to talk to you, and her face is right there, man. And you're like, <laughs> you tell me how you can do that and not exchange desire or kindle something apart from covenant. The wedding ceremonies we do come from culture and tradition and a lot of the Jewish heritage. So the daddy walks the bride down the aisle, and he, she's been under his covering. She's been under the authority of her home, her daddy. In front of witnesses and God, he takes her veil and he uncovers his daughter. He rolls it back and presents his daughter unveiled to the man she's about to join. It's powerful, if you understand. If it's just wedding tradition, it's Barbie and Ken and, oh, isn't her dress awesome? priest, the pastor, the whoever he is that's ordained, hopefully does a spiritual ceremony and joins them in a covenant understanding of love and communion and union, and boom, and they exchange vows. That's when Holy Spirit comes and makes them one, when they give their life and themselves to one another in vows and promises. Holy Spirit makes them one, not when the priest says, I now pronounce you man and wife. I'm telling you, Holy Spirit comes and makes them one when they give their lives in front of witnesses and God to one another. The wedding party, do you know why they're there, traditionally? Not to look good on pictures. <laughs> Not, oh no, I only have three, you have four. We gotta find somebody, the pictures are gonna look stupid. <laughs> hey, I know I just met you yesterday, could you come to my wedding? I'll get your tux, man, we just need four. They're witnesses. They're witnesses. They witness a union of covenant and vows and exchange of promise. And they're there before God witnessing, saying, we're here to do our part to see that this union is everything it was proclaimed to be, and we're going to do everything in our power to assure that. They're witnesses. They're witnessing a union before God and men. Yeah. The minister says, and now I'll pronounce you man and wife. Woo-hoo, everybody's woo-hoo. And everybody's like, whoa, kiss her. And he's, you may now. What's he implying? She hasn't yet. She's been covered until today. And we live in a society where the moms are saying to their 16, 15-year-old, did he kiss you? Did you guys kiss? We were trained in a sensual world that has caused us a lot of pain. 
and we have ride the wave of emotion again and again to where some people have gotten so disheartened it isn't even worth going on. Some people's heart get hard. Some people actually say, and I know this will create a little bit of a stir, well, I just don't think I like guys anymore. I don't think I like girls anymore. There's all kinds of stuff out there. Most of it revolves around sensuality and experiences. And we're always being driven to meet something inside of us and fulfill something that only He can. Man. So guess what He says about fornication, passion, and desire? Put it to death. We've studied a fallen man, and we think it's us. And Jesus said, follow me. There's a new man created in his image, created in newness. Or to put off, you'll see in the chat, the old and put on the new. Here's what's wrong with the former sexuality. It's self-serving, and it's all about me and how I feel and what I've received. Always. A lot of guys hide behind, well, no, I care about her, man. I want her satisfied. Want her, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and if it's been three days, you're letting her know. <clears throat> Honey. And wives, don't you power play what I'm saying and say, get off of me. It's only three days. Dan, you, don't be, you heard what Dan said. And then men start hating me for the gospel. why I don't talk about a lot of this stuff in a public room like I want to, because the Lord told me a long time ago that I can't. And the only time I ever talked openly in a group setting was the Kingdom Living School in 2010, a little pilot school, 50 people in the room. I went full-blown, uncensored, detailed, what I see as truth, and I refused everybody, their cell phone recordings. We shut off everything. It's not recorded on purpose. And I said, God, why can I teach this? When I first got onto all this and started experiencing for myself, why can't I teach it? He said, because where the heart of my people are, it'll do more harm than good. And people will hold each other to the message instead of become it. That's what he told me. And in the school, after 10 weeks, he let me go full-blown and shut off all recordings. And I said, God, why could I be that open in that room with married couples there and people there? Why did you let me uncensored go, bam, the way I see it? He said, because in 10 weeks, their hearts have been so changed by the truth and identity in me. He said it was a safe time to impart these things. Nobody will use it against one another. Nobody will hurt each other with it. They'll become it. I've conditioned their hearts for 10 weeks and there was a time for this message to land. People say, I want you to talk more about what sexuality looks like. I want you to talk. I can't do it in this setting. Because a wife might be feeling pressed by her husband. She might be feeling a little obligatory in her sexual function with her husband. And then, and then she might take what I'm saying to firm her stand and actually abstain from her husband and say, well, you need to love me more. You need to stop making it all about sex. You need to just grow up in God. You need to stop making it about, you make me feel this and this. And then he's like, man, but I, we used to get, and you boy. Now they have a fight because of the message instead of a revelation. So be careful, ladies, be careful, men. Don't take what people say about the gospel to allow you to stand in a way that's causing animosity, you allow it to change you into what he wants. Yeah. Are you following me? I hope that came out clear. Put to death. There's, there's folks out there that teach God made us this way. No, we became this way. You don't control your sex drive. You kill it as you know it. So it doesn't function from a self-centered foundation. And that it actually comes alive in a covenant love when you're ready to enter into that covenant place. Come on. Did Jesus come as a man? Did he say, follow me? Did he say, the things I do, you'll do if you believe? Did he say, as I am, so are you in the world? Could you picture him masturbating? Could you picture him lusting over Mary? 
Could you picture him saying, God, you know, why'd you forbid me a wife, man? We think it's a supernatural thing where God's just going, boom. I think it's a revelation. You say, yeah, but Paul said not everybody can do this. Not everybody. Well, then at least get married. Let's stop messing around. So if you're going to buy into Paul's writing and say, yeah, but, you know, Paul said not everybody has this gift. Well, then why don't you stop messing around and fueling a fire, getting a batting average, trying to hit homers? Why don't you give yourself to someone that wants to give themselves to you and why don't you start a covenant up and grow in God in that covenant? Guys, as a pastor, I've seen this thing hurt us so much. I've seen young people in the church sleep around with other people in the church and after a while it creates a mess. I, I, I can count on one hand the people I know that have kept their relationship pure in the sight of God until the day of wedding and I'm saved 22 years and I pastor, I can count on one hand and I can cut a couple fingers off. That's a problem. That means we have a weakness. That means we're driven by feelings and sensuality. We're needing experiences. And we've been trained by sensuality in the world. And he tells us to put it all to death. This isn't my sermon. He says kill it. It's not that sexuality is wrong. It's not that intimacy is wrong. It's not that intercourse is wrong. Are you kidding me? There's no reproduction apart from intimacy. But man, let's let it be love. And let's learn what Jesus created us for. And let's find the pot of gold underneath all the counterfeit and the exploitation. Let's dig down through all that and find the treasure that the devil is so intent on hiding from us. You name a topic in the earth that's a close second to what we're talking about. A close second. You name one topic that's a close second to sensuality and sexuality. Every commercial, every ad, they always have to have the dress blown by the fan and just enough leg that you see it. There's, it's, it's in everything, everywhere. Now you name one thing that's exploited more than that topic in your life on the earth that even comes close to second. Nobody can answer because there is none. Why? You don't counterfeit $1 bills. You counterfeit things of great value. There is a pot of gold and a truth at the bottom of this thing that is worth digging for people and putting off life as you've known it in that arena, coming together if you're married as husband and wife and asking Jesus for the true and real revelation so that you can come together and truly love one another in a holy place where his presence attends it and you guys actually love one another where an orgasm isn't your goal, but love is your goal. Yeah? You might be amazed what you bump into and how Holy Spirit will respond if you're willing to dig for the gold and put to death as you've <laughs> known it. <laughs> I milked that fall out, didn't I? See, that's what that drive's supposed to do. Fall to the ground and die, man. Put it to death. I heard once Kenneth Hagin was preaching and he walked off the thing and turned and went back on. That would be cool. Ah, oh, it would just be cool. I did have this experience in a home group. I was praying over this precious girl. She was broken. She was young. She didn't have any understanding. We were being very compassionate. I'm giving her truth. She's sobbing and bawling and I got a word for her. And I'm there praying over her. And it was summer and it's hot and they didn't have air conditioning, but they had a ceiling fan. That thing is just blowing on us and everybody's praying it's a serious moment and I'm standing there and this guy the owner of the house is standing there and I'm praying and his wife and, and I laid hands on her and I said Father I just thank you and I had my hands through the fan the fans just and he goes he just starts freaking out he just starts crying and I put my hand down and another person saw it and they're like they're freaking out they didn't know what to do and they're like what you just what? I said what's going on you, you had your hand the whole way through the fan and I said, well, it was innocent. I wasn't tempted to God, and I had no idea. Are you sure? It was up this far into the fan. And your fan was just, brrr, and it never touched me. I didn't even know my, that was sweet. Because he, because he was loving that girl. He said, oh, Dan, you didn't even see the fan. Ah, I'll take care of it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I like that. So it would just be awesome to just, ah. Man, all right, let me get done. I've got to go. Ah, ah, it's after 12. 
Oh. Therefore, put to death, put to death, put to death this list, guys. It's all idolatry. That's making something matter more that doesn't matter most. He's calling it idolatry. Whoa. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That means those that continue to disobey. In which you yourselves, see there's no pride in this, there's no self-righteousness. We don't see a man for the book by the cover, right? In what You all lived this way once when you all walked this way and lived this way. You yourselves all lived this way at one point. Put off the list, it's not you anymore. Do you hear how inclusive that is? There's people that disagree, disobey, that's not you. You're called out of darkness into the light. You once lived this way, so don't get arrogant and proud. My grace has saved you and changed you. My truth has turned you around. See them with compassion. Don't judge them, but don't live that way. That's what it's saying. Watch. But now you yourselves, you yourselves, it's not an order call. It's the application of truth. You yourselves put off, put off these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language from your mouths. You yourselves put off. How do I put off this list of sensual, sexual, passion, desire, fornication, anger, frustration? How do I put off this list without running the risk of getting into works and failing? Good question. You put it off in prayer. You put it off with understanding. You get alone with God and understand what these scriptures are saying and go, duh, this was never me from the beginning. I've been trained in a lie. God, I was literally homeschooled in the wrong home. I had false teaching all around me. The way that seems man, right to a man has been my teacher. And right now you're my teacher and you're a good teacher. You never made me for me. You never made me for my own desire, the fulfillment of my own urges and passions. God, you made me to love. You made me to be an outraying expression of light. You made me to live for your name and the sake of others. And God, you're changing me. I put off the right and the foundation to be an angry and frustrated and judgmental and proud, just fornication and driven and sexually just motivated. God, I want everything to be pure in my life and I surrender life as I've known it so that I can step into who you are in me, Christ, the hope of glory. God, I put it off. You do it in prayer, guys. You don't do it biting your lip and trying harder. You do it in prayer because you're saved by grace through so if you release faith in the truth, grace comes to make truth your reality. And all of a sudden you are what you are by the grace of God and there's no boasting in men. And he gets all the glory and you get changed. Yay. Why? Because you're a believer. Okay. Do you guys get this? Don't lie to one another. Why? Because you put off the old man and his deeds and you've put on the... So in prayer, you put off the old man. Any man in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things. I mean, he's talking about motive, heart, intent. Yeah. Watch this. You're going to put on the new man. Who's the new man? Renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So what's the gospel? A restoration back to his image. It's right here. What's 2 Corinthians 3 say? Beholding is in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Shoo! People say, what's your gift in the body? I'm an image consultant. getting us back to the image. <laughs> See, I never read that in the list of giftings. It's here! So watch this. Let me skip down. You're going to put off the old man and his deeds. You do it in prayer. Watch this. This is what my prayer life has looked like. I don't pray this way anymore. It's my reality. There's a time I really prayed this way, and it just got settled in me, and grace poured into me, and it's just my reality. I just wake up this way. I just see this way. It's changed me. The gospel's changed me. But, but, but I, every once in a while, I just thank God for things. But I don't pray this way anymore. But there was a season where this is the only way I really prayed. I'd go in my bedroom. Wow, Father, thank you. I'm born again. I have new life through you. My life's not the same. 
never again will stress and strife and anger and frustration rule my life and dominate my life and have a place in my life because I realized it was never made for me. I was made for your image and your glory and your love. So God, I just put off everything that was self-centered, everything that was non-productive, everything that pertained to me, that gave men a right to make me less than you. I call it all dead. And God, I just put on your loving kindness, your tender mercies, patience. God, I am a tree ripe for the picking and I am planted in the field of God and even in this earth, I am a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord and men can pick of me and eat and be satisfied. You have changed my life forever. I am fruitful, God, because of you. Thank you for my life. What a gift, life in Christ. That's my prayer life. Yeah? Never again, God, with this. I had a pastor in my life said, you've got to be careful praying that never again thing. You're going to get condemned. If you slip and fall, then how are you going to get? I said, listen, man, that is a high level of faith. I'm believing it's possible. I'm going after the goal. I'm following Jesus, not our experiences. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but nothing. We are going after God. And I understand I'm not condemned. It's not about failing. It's about the privilege of becoming. So if I would have walked through my day and stumbled, right? What do I do? Run right back to God. Father, I so thank you for the truth that's working in my life that shows me what that really is. And that is so not who you are in me and who I am in you. And God, you are doing a change in me. And because of your grace, I'm wiser, sharper, and smarter than ever before. That is so not in my heart. And I thank you. It's being rooted out of my life. God, you're amazing. That sure beats naked and ashamed, hiding from the Lord. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just a little late. They wanted 1230, I wanted 12. We're going in the middle. We're the car salesman thing, you know. 10-5, 11-2, 10-8. Okay, therefore, therefore, as the elect of God, verse 12, holy and beloved. Watch, put on. It's a place of prayer. It's not a place of works. Place of prayer. Put off, put on. Fasting is an amazing time to do it. Go into a little season of fasting. You kneel down, put off. You stand up, put on, and watch the grace come into your fast. Communion. Take the communion elements. What a contact point of faith. Wow, your body. This is what you showed me. This is what you proved. This is what you revealed. Man, you gave your life, and now I yield my life. And Father, I just thank you that no longer will I be driven by this, that, or this, but I thank you that you are the very strength of my life, the motivating force. God, your love is what moves me. I appreciate you. Thank you for covenant. Man, you're the put off, put on. Yeah, that sure beats, God, I'm thanking you for your love. I sure don't understand it. I don't know how you put up with me and tolerate me. And I know I never get it right, but it's like you still keep loving me and forgiving me. So thanks for forgiving me. Here's to you. <laughs> That's not what that means. Okay. Put on what? Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Watch this. Bearing with one another. Forgiving one another. Watch this. If anyone has a complaint against another, call Chris or Joey or PJ and get it straight. No. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ, what? Past tense, already forgave you. He expects that you're walking in the beauty and glory of being forgiven, and that produces forgiveness in you. So even as you have been forgiven, forgive others. In the Old Testament, you had to forgive to be forgiven. In this covenant, you forgive because of the glory of forgiveness. You've been forgiven. Shoo! People that have a hard time with forgiveness reveal to me they've never tasted the joy of being forgiven. They've never just realized that God has completely forgiven them and washed them clean. Because if you stand in the righteous judgment of God and wash clean and, 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 and know you're forgiven, forgiveness becomes your heart and righteousness becomes your judgment. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So it's never duty, it's never legalistic, it's never biting your lip trying to forgive. That means you're not. I wonder if the gospel would take the grid away for unforgiveness and it wouldn't be, well, but it's hard. I'm trying to forgive, but it's hard. No, that's called I don't understand. Could you imagine God toying with his heart? 
man, I, I want to forgive them, but man, they're pushing me out. Well, yeah. tell you, uh, you know, you know. <laughs> I'll send my son. I'll try it. It's not like that. You forgive because you've been forgiven. Do you think for a second God has lavished you with forgiveness so you can just enjoy being forgiven or so you can become the very thing? Do you think he gives us mercy so we can obtain it or become it? You be merciful, for I am merciful. Okay, I'm done. I'm reading this. I'm going to pray over you guys. We're going to go to lunch because I won't shut up. I won't. I just, every time I'm up here, you guys are sincere and hungry and you're easy targets. You're easy targets. You guys are the best. I'm not saying that lightly. You guys are awesome. God is doing something as a corporate whole in this room. I can feel it, man. It's like, oh, when I mean that, I mean spiritually, I can discern it. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If you have a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also forgive. Now watch this. But above all these things, put on. It's a place of prayer. How do you become love? How do you teach on love and then, and then you leave and become it? You have to want to, remember? If you don't want to, you won't put it on. You won't get alone with God and say, your heart impresses me. Man, people dogged you. They mocked you. They scoffed you. They hit you unjustly. They lied about you behind the scenes. There was people that lied about you to your face in front of Pilate and the Sanhedrin. Nothing changed you. Nothing got to you. Nothing made you different. You're amazing. Your love never fails. I shall honor you. You're so solid and so secure. You're such a rock. You're such a firm foundation. Man, I want to be rooted in you. Yeah? Come on. This is what it means. You put him on. You put on love. Above all these things, what do you put on? Put on love. Why? It's the bond of perfection. If I love, I have no cause for stumbling in my brother. Actually, 1 John 4 says, if I love, it's because I know God. If I don't love, I don't know God. It doesn't say you don't pastor, lead a church, or lead worship, or serve in a ministry. It doesn't say you don't recognize your need for a Savior and you're sincere about being forgiven. It says, if I don't love, there's one reason. I don't know Him. Which means knowing Him is transforming, and this is eternal life that you might know Him. The only true God and His Son, Jesus Christ, to me, Son. You get it? Father, I pray for this house. I thank You for the words. I thank You, God, that You've sown it into good, solid soil. I just thank You for fruit abounding. That canvas illustration, Lord, I pray that every person here would begin to fill that canvas with trees upon trees, that God, it would just work out in the kingdom the way it works, the way You set it in order, that fruitfulness would bring more fruitfulness and more fruitfulness. And God, I just pray sincerely. You said I can have whatever I ask believing, and I believe this sincerely. This isn't hype. I, I, I didn't qualify that for me or for God. I, I qualified that for you so you don't think that. That, Lord, every person in this room would grow into a, a good tree and a fruitful tree, and that every person in this room in their end days would have a completely full canvas of oak trees covering their mountains. And I thank you that one seed will turn into a forest of fruitfulness. I bless this house and I pray we run well and stay steadfast in the truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you enjoyed this message, please visit danmullerarchive.com to find over 2,500 more messages from Dan, all organized by category, playlist, and search. Enjoy.